Welcome to Heaven and Earth. My name is Wyatt Graham. And I'm joined by Professor Herman Selderhaus. And we're here to talk about kind of Reformation history. I, I don't know exactly where we're going to go, but we talked about Martin Bootser, John Calvin, and Martin Luther already. So we'll probably at least get there and we'll see how the conversation goes. As we get going, Herman, could you just kind of introduce yourself in a way that you think might be appropriate for the conversation or <laughs> any way that you feel like yeah. you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, appropriate. Well, I'm a professor of church history and church polity. And I'm the president of the Theological University in Apeldoorn, which is a city right in the middle of the Netherlands, just as every city is in the middle of the Netherlands because it's just <laughs> a small country. And um, I'm the director of uh, Refo 500. That's a network uh, working on the relevance and the heritage of the Reformation. And I have some other uh, functions also. Um, and uh, I'm a husband, a father, grandfather, and um, I preach every Sunday as uh, our professors are expected to go out to visit the congregations and to uh, also uh, speak to normal people while we deal with students during the week <laughs> and academics. Um, so that's maybe the most essential for this conversation, depending on where we go. Okay, well, that's helpful. Uh... I'll, I'll link probably in the notes some of your books, maybe Reformation 500 and all that kind of stuff, so people can have a sense of, of your ministry and your academic kind of efforts. Um, as we get going, I just have a kind of a broad picture question. It strikes me, as uh, someone from North America, that I am, my church, my church life is so indebted to the European Reformation, and I suppose the English Reformation as well. But in many ways, it almost seems like today, the kind of Reformed church is growing in North America, but there's a different, it seems very odd in Europe in terms of like how to locate it. So I'd just be very curious, like in the 21st century, how do you understand the reformed churches in Europe and England? Like just a big picture. Do you think, are the prospects like, is there continual growth? Is there just so much change happening or is it maybe kind of decreasing in terms of influence? Well, f from a human perspective, it doesn't look too good. So numbers are going down. Uh, churches are closing uh, also because many that have been member of the church out of tradition because their parents were members, uh, they're now in the process of breaking away from the church. Um, we also see, and I think in, in the Netherlands that is due to the many splits we had over the centuries, uh, you know, we have a wide variety of reformed denominations. Um, and uh, that uh, especially younger generations, um, well, they don't like that anymore. Uh, they, so they just want to be Christians and they have less interest in church and congregation. Um, I think the picture in the Protestant world, Reformed world is even better than the Catholic world uh, in the Netherlands and I think in Europe in general. Uh, on the other side, what I do see is a, a growing interest in, in religion in general, but also in the Christian faith, um, and especially a longing for more uh, deepening of understanding, uh, eagerness for knowledge. I can see that in our Theological University in Apeldoorn, a growing number of students, also uh, what we call uh, late callers. Uh, so people uh, for a second career or people that take some courses. Um, I, I have a, in my Reformation theology classes, uh, I, I have a butcher who closes his store on Tuesday in order to uh, take classes in Reformation theology. And um, he, he's just, just an example. So as it goes uh, regarding church stru structures, church organization, the prospect is not too good as to interest in faith and religion, it looks better. But, you know, if I look from it from the um, from the, the Christian perspective, from the biblical perspective, uh, I'm still thankful that, you know, that the word is preached every Sunday and uh, in spite of all that's going on, uh, we're, we still live in a, in a free Europe where we can build churches, where we can spread the gospel, where we can have a seminary like our theological university is funded by the state for 70%, uh, and still we can have our own um, uh, classes and our own content, we can stick to our confessions. So Europe is still in a blessed situation. And it's, instead of looking at things that go bad, I think this is also a time of chances and challenges. 
That's a good perspective. And it is interesting. There are so many challenges by the sounds of it. And I know some of them just because I have some connections in France and Spain in terms of ministry, but I, not for all of Europe, of course, but it is interesting. You still have a number of universities that are, that are funded by the state to, to teach Christian pastors. And uh, that happens in Canada. It's not quite the same, but we do have um, some public funded uh, kind of colleges that are Protestant in nature. It's, it's a little bit different though than I would than it sounds like from your situation. You did talk about some church splits, and it's interesting that um, in the Reformation itself, maybe I'll put it this way. Um, there, there was a pretty big split in the Lutheran and the Reformed churches. I almost think of it this way, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, though. It almost seems like, at least in the Swiss Confederacy, that every sort of um, city-state was as almost its own denomination. <laughs> If you want to put yeah. it that way, if you want to kind of apply it today's today's category, so Zurich, and Basel and Strasbourg, and uh, Geneva, for example, they they were all kind of working together, but they had their own different hues and and uh, pieces that they might have that would differ from each other, and in a real sense, they're almost like different denominations. Is that like a fair analogy, or how would you kind of put that sort of distinction? Yes, well, see, the, the Reformation uh, comes up in a situation where, um, for example, if you, now you mentioned Switzerland, there was a lot of competition between the various cities. Uh, there was uh, economic, um, mostly, and there was also um, a regional, like, you know, if you're from Geneva, you don't like people from Zurich. That, that's how it goes. I don't know how it works in Canada. If, if uh, people from Camp Vancouver do not like people from uh, Montreal or so, I, I don't know how it works. But it, it certainly works in, uh, was that way in, in Europe. And in fact, it still is. So I think that is one, one, uh, one issue. Uh, so you have to do with local um, peculiarities. And, uh, and in the wider perspective, there is, uh, and that's still is so today, the, the difference in the competition between Germans and Swiss, uh, which was one of the reasons for the split between Zwingli and, and Luther, that was not just on, on, the, on the Eucharist. Um, that was part of it. It was also, here comes this Lutheran farmer, um, you know, this, this wild uh, guy from the north with this fine humanist Zwingli from Switzerland. You know, that's, that's two worlds colliding. Mm. The advantage that Geneva had with uh, with Kelvin is that he was not from Geneva. He was French, as you know, so he was he was a refugee. And that that made him more um, uh, made he was more able to uh, to connect people to think of how can we uh, reunite these various parties within the Reformation. So it it did not only have to do with theological differences confessional um, issues, but also with uh, nationalities, personalities, biographies, um, and like I said, lo local competition. Yeah, that's interesting, because when you kind of look into it, a guy like Oleg Zwingli from, from Zurich, uh, or at least that's where he ministered, he was very kind of patriotic in a sense. Uh, he in fact died defending his city in 1531. Luther himself is very much about like the German people and like even in his treatises that are, are um, if I remember this right, against Rome. And part of the argument is that, that Rome is depriving the German people of their, say, money or, or whatever the case is. And so there's a bit of an overlap between, it's not nationalism because that didn't quite exist, but like a patriotism maybe is a put, like a love of yes, the homeland, yeah, love of the yeah, people. Yeah. Well, Luther was far better in public relations than Swingley. Mm. Um, and Luther really knew what he was doing. See, I, I was brought up with the idea that Luther... He ended up in a monastery and he didn't know where he was going. And one night he couldn't sleep because he was afraid to die and appear before God and then go to hell. And then one night he was walking around in, in, in the halls of the monastery. He stumbled over something, found out it was a Bible. He started reading it, opened it in Romans 1, read about justification by faith. He thought this is it. And by the end of the week, uh, he, he, he was a member of, 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 my, my, of the Free Reformed Church. Um, um, but the fact is that the, the story was different, but also that he really knew that what with what message he could get the people behind him. So he also knew that it was not true that most so much money went from Germany to Rome. 
But he knew that if that is my message, people will like me and will say, hey, we got to listen to this guy. So I, I'm not saying he was lying. I was not saying he was fooling. He was being political mm -hmm. uh, in, in this respect. And that worked well for his message. It, it does. And he's strategic. Um, I read a book called Brand Luther. I can't remember the author's yep. name. Uh, I, I have no idea who the author is. But I, one thing that impressed me in the book is how closely Luther worked with the printers. If I remember right, uh, for the pictures, for the kind of spacing in the font, how everything looked. And it kind of reminds you of uh, the mid 20th century Canadian, uh, whose name I can't remember either, who talks about the, uh, the media is the message. Meaning, while, while Luther, of course, was preaching the gospel, he was very careful on how to convey that message into the people's hands. The way that he wrote his treatises and tracts and letters and books or whatever you want to call them, he was very careful because he wanted people to read them and be persuaded by them. And I think yes. we've lost a little bit of that. I don't know what do you want to call it, strategic thinking. Well, I think the Gospel Coalition is doing a good job. I think Luther would be uh, would be proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the way you spread the gospel. So you, you make use of the newest techniques and you send out books and materials. And that's what Luther did. Um, I don't know if it works for the Gospel Coalition also, but um, for the printers in Wittenberg and other cities, they made big money out of Luther. And he never asked a, a cent for it. Mm. He was just concerned about spreading the gospel. Uh, and he, so like I said, he was not being political for because he wanted to be political, but he used this political, this rhetorical message to bring the gospel to the people, the, go the gospel that he rediscovered, not as something from a book, but very existential in his own life. Mm. And um, uh, of course, it was helpful that there were so many publishers and they saw this is uh, business. Um, so they cooperated, um, but... Um, um, I think it, it was it is more than just uh, bringing out books. It was also the way he spoke that the people could understand. They knew he meant what he was saying, and the words he chose they were well chosen, so everyone could could uh, could understand uh, what is this guy talking about. And then they found out he's talking about me and about the Lord. Yes, and I want to repeat something you said and kind of just expand on it. Like, uh... Luther didn't take royalties from his books. Like he, he basically, I think until after he was married, if I remember right, he, he really had no money. Like he was just provided for. So he, he was, you know, a kind of inter, into ministry for the sake of ministry. Yes, I was, uh, I was struck reading that. I, um, for my Luther biography, I read all his works, all his letters for, you know, for two or three years. And um, I was struck by, in the way, his, um, his trusting people that they would do good things, not knowing that they kind of ripped him off also uh, regarding books. They made the money, the printers, and he got nothing. But also this, this, this attitude of, like what he told his wife, uh, he says, you know, what we have has been given to us by the Lord, so why not give it away? It's not ours anyways. Mm -hmm. And uh, th this attitude comes, of course, from someone who, as a monk, promised eternal poverty. So he, has n he had no connection with property at all. And th that is good if you're a monk and you don't have a family. But if you have a wife and kids, you have to take some responsibility. But he never did. So after he passed away in 1546, um, his wife, Katharina van Bora, she ended up in poverty because nothing had been arranged. There were no savings. There was no uh, no wedding, no contract. There was no um, how do you call that when uh, someone dies? No uh, will, no, well, no will left. Because he did not trust lawyers for good reasons, I think. But he did not trust lawyers, <laughs> so uh, there was no will. And um, she was happy to get some money from like the king of Denmark and some others. Um, but that was how he lived. Also. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important issue because he expected that the, the return of Christ would be during his lifetime. So why worry? Why worry about organizing the church? Why worry about money? Christ is returning. I will be the witness. 
Uh, so all we have to do, and that's what he says, all we have to do is preach, preach, preach. That's, that's something I want to ask you about. It, it isn't so the Ottoman Turks are at the eastern gate yeah. of the Holy Roman Empire. So 1526, the Battle of Mohawks is significant. And then I think it's like in maybe 1529, I can't remember the year offhand, 1530, where they actually get to Vienna. And um, this strikes me as probably playing into this apocalyptic mindset, but you actually, you almost see it everywhere, at least in the Holy Roman Empire, that everybody, it's like, this is the end times. Yeah. Uh, like the Munster, uh, uh, the, the Munster uh, is Munster actually in the Netherlands today, in modern day Netherlands? Uh, no, Munster is in Germany, okay. and um, I, at the moment I'm um, at the office of Rifu 500, which is uh, three kilometers from okay. the German border. So, 45 minutes drive from here is Munster. Okay, New Jerusalem. Yeah, New Jerusalem, which is which yeah. odd. Uh, it's here around the corner. Yeah, and you can still, uh, I mean, we can talk about. You can still see the uh, the the, um, the cages. Uh, cages, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so. So why was maybe I'll ask the question directly? Why did everybody think the end of the world was was nigh? <laughs> I mean, it strikes me as as odd. Is it because of the Ottoman Turks? Is it just because of the Reformation? Like it's there's a lot of apocalyptic fervor in the early 16th century. Yes, um, I think it is because many things happened that had been described in Revelations, or people saw that uh, things that were happening in their times were fulfillments of the prophecies of, of, uh, of, of Lord Jesus and also of revelations. So uh, wars, revolts, um, uh, the pest uh, as, a, as a pandemic uh, going around about. And then in the midst of that, for Luther, this, this rediscovery of the gospel that the Bible comes back on the pulpit and the, the, uh, the message is, is brought and it, it conquers um, cities and, 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 and hearts and people and nations. So there's on the one hand, the suppression, there is uh, poverty, everything that's been described in Revelation. And there's also this signal that the Lord is coming and the preparatory phase is this spreading of the gospel through the message of Martin Luther and his, and his assistants, his colleagues, his followers. Yeah, and, um, yeah. Yeah. Did he? So, so Calvin kind of seems some, sees himself as a bit of, of a prophet. Does Luther see himself as as kind of a prophet as well? Is that part of his identity? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He he sees himself as a prophet. Others also. Uh, when when Luther passes away in um, in in Eisleben, that's uh, also the city where he was born. So he was there to uh, to bring two brothers to to uh, dukes that were arguing. Uh, try to bring them together. He passed away. And then the message of Luther's death comes in Wittenberg. And Philip Melanchthon, his colleague, is, is teaching in, in class. And someone comes in class and says, well, Luther passed away. And then Melanchthon you know, starts quoting that Elijah has gone to heaven. And uh, the, the same words. So he was seen as, as Elijah, as, as the prophet of God. And that's how he saw himself also. That, that is also the, the troublesome thing about Luther. See, if you think you are the prophet, uh, then uh, everything you say is right and everyone else is wrong. Right. And that, that became a burden to Melanchthon and to others also in the end of his life. What almost strikes me that um, Melanchthon in particular is, is almost like protecting the Reformation or protecting people from Luther. Like there's a, you know, Calvin will write, uh, try to get to Luther, Melanchthon will kind of Lock that letter. <laughs> it really shouldn't go to him this time. And uh, there, are, there's some kind of management happening there. Melanchthon, in particular, though, is like I think he's a genius theologian, and oh, yes. we yeah. we tend to forget him. I almost feel like without Melanchthon, Luther couldn't have done what Luther did. Meaning, Luther. My impression of Luther is that he's a great communicator, great pastor, great preacher, but he's not always tidy. And Melanchthon's tidy, meaning he can write his, uh, uh, was, I think 1521 is his first edition of the Loki Communis. Yeah, it was and it's tidy and good, and you can read it today, and it's totally understandable. You might actually mention it in your book on John Calvin, someone does anyways, that in France, people were less worried about uh, Martin Luther being read, but more worried about Philip Melanchthon being read. Yes, yeah, they, they thought Melanchthon was more, uh, so from the, the Catholic side, Melanchthon was um, more dangerous than Luther. And then as soon as Kelvin comes on stage, then 
Well, they they really get scared because this guy is even smarter. His, his theology is even more founded and more more developed. Um, Melanchthon, on the other hand, is also the person who tries to save the church from breaking in two parts. So he at the, the Diet of Augsburg, 1530, um, he tries to find uh, formulations that can also satisfy those Catholics that also long for reformation. Uh, but like you said, you know, he's, he's uh, the man who together with Kelvin brought this rediscovery of Luther uh, into a more well-ordered uh, uh, structure. Um, in when, when I start teaching um, uh, Luther, so I, we have a Luther class every year, um, and I always compare Luther to the man in Texas who finds oil. So he digs in the ground, and all of a sudden there comes this oil, you know, and, and it goes right up in the air. Um, and he's happy about that. But then you need also... Um, uh, someone to uh, like a drilling place and you need a ref refinery and you need gas stations. And uh, so then come Melanchthon and Kelvin and they organize that this oil comes to the right place, is refined uh, and uh, is, is suitable for daily use, so to speak. Um, Melanchthon says when Luther uh, has passed away that he suffered a lot from him because of his rough attitude, his rough words, his uh, is lightly being irritated. Uh, but Kelvin says, maybe also because he never met Luther, Kelvin says, you know, um, whatever you say about Luther, whatever wrongs and sins he did, uh, he was the uh, apostle sent from God. And uh, I have, I have um, you know, uh, great honor for him. And even if he would call me the, the, the worst of names, I will praise him forever. Interesting. I think he says that in his institutes, right? Am I correct on that? Yes, and several times in, in his letters, letters also, yeah. It's So one thing that's interesting to me in, in this in, uh, kind of comparison is that Zwingli, uh, Ulrich Zwingli dies in 1531, and then Bollinger takes over. And Bollinger, to my, in my mind, is a great, is kind of like Melanchthon, a great organizer, works with people, where Zwingli is kind of blunt force trauma kind of thing. It's kind of an interesting just thing to imagine that if Luther had died early in the 1530s and, and Melanchthon took over fully, could there be a united reformed church? Uh, could there be a Lutheran and reformed alliance? I just, it's just kind of an interesting thought experience because it, it seems that Melanchthon and others were very much more open to it than Luther himself was. Because Luther, if I understand right, would just, well, in the 1529, is it uh, at, the, uh, at the Diet of Spire? No, not the Diet. Um, it's a uh, 1529, uh, the Marburg. The Marburg, Marburg Colloquy, Colloquy, 1529. Colloquy they, get together. Yes. They, uh, they have a huge disagreement, Martin Luther and Rick Zwingli. And apparently Zwingli at one point breaks into tears over this thing. Um, whether or not that's actually true, that's, that's what I've read. Um, th that almost is like the birth of denominationalism right there because they really decide they can't work together. Can you kind of explain why do they not work together? Why, would, why couldn't Martin Luther work with Zwingli and the Swiss reformers? What was the problem? Um, well, the problem was, um, um, among others, the one is German, the other is Swiss. Okay. Um, Luther is um, a, a monk um, coming from a different medieval theological tradition than Zwingli. Zwingli is um, a student of Erasmus, and Luther hates Erasmus. Mm. Um, so that's that's a few things you know that makes this relation troublesome. But I think the most important thing is their biographies, and um, I, I, I will try to you know, say it in brief. So Luther, he enters the monastery, um, trying to do as much as he can to get into the right relation with God until he finds out that salvation is not from something that I do, something that comes from me, but it is it lies outside of me. So in the Latin, extra nos. So the certainty of faith lies outside of me in the work of Jesus Christ. 
Now, Swingley, being a priest in Einsiedeln, uh, a, a town, uh, a pilgrimage town in, in Switzerland, he sees a lot of outside religion. And he goes just the other way. He finds out religion is not something from the outside, but it's something that happens inside. So whereas Luther tried to find it from in the inside and found out that's not where it is, it is outside. Swingley says it's not the outside, it is the inside, it's the heart that matters. So they, they, they come from various bi biographical directions. Uh, from both their um, their 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 priestly their their uh, monastery history, and they cannot just they cannot connect. They are not on the same track. It's like you know two trains that you have to connect, but they are on separate rails, and it just doesn't work. So they cannot understand. And there in Marburg, uh, this all comes down to the Lord's Supper, whereas Swingley says. It is not the outside thing. So it's not the bread, it's the wine or the wine. It is what happens in the heart of the believer. And Luther says, the heart of the believer, I've been there, man. And that doesn't work. It is outside. So I need this physical presence of Christ in the bread and the wine as a confirmation that salvation is outside of me. Mm. Whereas then Swingley says, well, I've been there also. Everything that's outside, that is physical, material, does not bring you to God. So they could not understand. And then there is Butzer at the same table, the, the reformer from Strasbourg. And he tries to connect these, these guys, but it doesn't work. And then, so, and then we need um, uh, Kelvin, who has not been in a monastery, who has not been through this biographical experience of, of conversion, the way Swingley and Luther had that. And there is Heinrich Bullinger, uh, also less existential in his um, in his conversion experience and they can just look at the thing and say well we can we can find formulations uh, to bring this together and that's what uh, Kelvin wants he first wants to bring Bullinger so the swinging tradition a little closer to Luther and then go to the Lutherans and say well uh, can can we move a little can you move a little close to Swingley and then we have a a reunification of the Protestant world. Mm -hmm. but, but by that time, Luther has passed away and then starts a great discussion about, uh, about who is the real um, uh, follower of, of Luther. You know, this, this discussion that happens every time. Mm -hmm. And then the hardliners win and that's the end of, of the hope on reunification. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, didn't, okay, I didn't know that. Uh... I want to get to Martin Butzer in, in just a sec here. But yeah. I, I think it's, you, you noted, so you have Bollinger, you have Luther, uh, you have Kelvin, all these names kind of. It's interesting to see how they all are in different geography, and yet they're often working together. Like I, I think of like um, Kelvin's first edition of the Institutes really hmm. is like Luther's um, uh, catechism in terms of format. Yeah. Yeah. He's obviously influenced. Uh, the 39 Articles of England, Thomas Cranmer. Pretty influenced by uh, by um, by the Augsburg Confession, I, I think Lutheran theology. Anyways, in fact, Melanchthon uh, was slated to go to England, but doesn't go because of a <laughs> because he doesn't go. <laughs> I can't I can't remember the story offhand, but it's kind of a because he's reading of his the stars, horoscope. right? Yes, horoscope. His horoscope. Yes. Um, but there's like this really tight connection across Europe, and you even have like people in Poland and all over the place, all, all more connected than we might imagine. It seems to me that Martin. Uh, Bootser in Strasbourg is while he lives kind of almost glue that ties a lot of people together and he's one who takes a lot of abuse for it on both sides <laughs> you can't yeah. make anyone happy if it's Roman Catholics or the Lutherans or the uh, other reformers and yet he's kind of an amazing person I don't remember if you mentioned I think I'm sure you do in your in your book but Bruce Gordon too in his biography of Calvin that really, uh, 13, 1538 to 1541, when Calvin is in Strasbourg with Bootser, it's kind of like a transformation for Calvin because Bootser is kind of his mentor, his father figure, I think maybe is what you, you say. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, that kind of makes sense to me. It's where he kind of learns to be a, a pastor. So Calvin was kind of a genius, but he learns to be a pastor and to, to actually uh, serve people in a, in a new way because of Martin Bootser. So probably everybody listening to this 
has either never heard of Martin Bootser or um, if they have, it's in passing reference as if he's not significant to the story. So like, why is he significant in your own kind of off the cuff words? <laughs> um, well, first of all, uh, there would not have been the Kelvin we know if it weren't for Martin Bootser. Um, so Kelvin get, gets kicked out of Geneva after only two years of work in there, 1536, 1538. Um, he has nowhere to go. He, he ends up in Strasbourg. Um, and uh, then uh, Butzer, who is the pastor there, says, well, I, I, need, I need a pastor for these French refugees, and you're the man. And Kelvin doesn't want that. He, he wants to be a scholar, just, you know, study books and write books, you know, like we all want. <laughs> uh, and then Bootser says, no way, you know, if, if you go for that, the Lord will curse you. And uh, well, that's that's the last thing Kelvin wants. So he, he gets there and there he learns from Bootser um, the uh, what we call a confession of faith. So young people around the age of 17, 16, uh, doing confession, profess pro professing their faith um, as as a as a as a gate between um, baptism and Lord's Supper. In Strasbourg from Butzer, he learns singing. It is in Strasbourg that Kelvin for the first time hears a congregation singing. You know, this is, mm. and then he, he starts, he says, well, this is wonderful. We, we got to do that. And uh, that's how we, we get to singing psalms and, and later on hymns. Uh, in, um, in Strasbourg, he learns from Butzer the offices of deacon and elder. Uh, that, that's Butzer's work. Um, in Strasbourg, he also learns how discipline works in the church. He uh, learns how to um, work on being, uh, uh, how should I say that? Um, being a missionary Christian. Uh, these are all the things that Kelvin learns from Butzer in Strasbourg. But why did we forget Butzer? That's for two reasons. The first is Butzer was a little too ecumenical for later generations because he tried to bring Swingley together and Luther together that made him suspect for Lutherans and for Swinglians. He tried to bring Protestant Catholics together that made him suspect, suspect for Catholics and for Protestants. That's one aspect. The other aspect is he needs too many words to say something. You know, he's like a preacher that needs uh, 55 minutes to say what he could have said in 15 minutes. And uh, some people don't mind, but most people say, well, man, keep it short, you know, make the message clear. Just Butzer cannot do it, but Calvin can. Uh, and so we have forgotten Butzer, but there's a lot of Butzer in Calvin. Uh, and also a lot of Luther in Calvin. Uh, I think if you would, um, well, you have these red letter Bibles with all the words of Jesus in red. If you would have a red letter edition of the Institutes, uh, it would be full of Butzer and Luther. Mm. Well, I'm right, uh, I think it's book three and I'm pretty sure chapter 19. It's on, on the freedom of the, uh, of the Institutes, uh, on the freedom of the Christian. And mm. uh, if that's not, like Luther's 1520 treaties on the freedom of the Christian, I don't know what is. I mean, I, if I remember right, it's, it's very similar. There's the two kingdom, yeah, is, uh, yeah. two reign, whatever you want to call it, uh, theology present in there. And uh, it's, it's quite fascinating. So you definitely do see that. Uh, Butzer is also significant in the English Reformation. He, doesn't he die in England, if memory serves? Yes. Yeah, he dies in England. Yes. Yeah, he, um, so... Uh, at a certain moment, the uh, the tides turn for the Reformation, and then the Emperor Charles V he regains um, his territory, and uh, he's at the walls of the city of Strasbourg, and he demands that Strasbourg um, reintroduces celebrating mass hmm. because that has been uh, had been forbidden in the in the twenties. And then Butzer says, no way, no, mass is such, a, such an offense to God, such an idolatry. We're not going to do that. And then uh, Charles says, well, uh, either you, you start celebrating mass again, introduce mass, or I'll bomb the whole city. 
And then Butzer says, well, then bomb the whole city. You know, this is so essential. That mass is so unbiblical. Mm. Uh, we'd rather bomb the city. But then, you know, the mayor of Strasbourg said, well, wait a minute. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is a nice city. <laughs> uh, and then Butzer has to leave and he, he goes to England. And he, he's not very happy there but because, you know, as, uh, in England, there's a lot of rain and it's, it's uh, foggy and it's cold. And uh, they even sent him a German uh, stove to get warm, but it doesn't work. And uh, after uh, two years, he, he, he dies in England. Yes. Yeah. But he has been very influential in England uh, through his works on the Regno Christi, so uh, the, 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 the kingdom of Christ. Um, but you know that that's another another chapter. But Butzer is more influential than is often seen, but his name is is forgotten, and I, I don't think he 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 would care about that. So he must, did he die? In, is it fifteen fifty one that he died? Fifteen fifty one. Yes. Yeah. Fifteen forty nine is the Augsburg interim where things yeah. go bad for the Protestants or the yeah. whatever you want to call them evangelicals. Um, as we kind of close down the discussion, I do want to hit one more piece of conversation. And that's Bootser on divorce and remarriage. Um, cool. I don't actually know too much about it, to be honest. I, I just know that this is a significant uh, contribution that he makes to reform thinking. So could you get kind of just, what? why is that significant? What does yeah. he say that's unique or interesting? The interesting thing is that Bootser comes to around 13 grounds for divorce. Oh, 13. Where Yes, where the Catholic tradition only had one, that is adultery. Adultery, okay. And the Reformed tradition had one and a half. Abandonment? So, yes, yeah. Um, but Butzer says there are 13. Okay. And he, he approaches um, this from the value of the Old Testament. He says Old Testament and New Testament are on the same level. So you that the, the like the, the the how do you call it in English? I don't know the the letter of sending away your wife. Is that a how do you call oh, it? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, letter of I I know it's, it's yeah, letter of divorce, but whatever yes. the word is. If if the Lord allowed, if God allowed that in the Old Testament, that is still valid in the New Testament because God does not change His mind. But the interesting thing is that these grounds for divorce, these many He has. Uh, he has them um, for the profit of the women. Uh, that's what for the profit of the children, because he says children suffer from a bad marriage. Yeah. Um, so a divorce might be a rescue for the children. And um, that is not a liberal attitude. Because what he's, he, he's, he means to say is that if children see in so many sins in the way their father and mother deal with each other in a bad marriage, they might become sinners themselves and they might be lost forever. So it is for Butzer always in the setting of eternal salvation. Hmm. Um, another aspect is... Uh, he says someone that goes to church is not automatically a believer. Not everything that walks to the stable is a cow. <laughs> That's what he says. Yeah. Um, so there's the inside and the outside. There might be an outside church membership, but that does not mean an inside membership of the family of God. He says the same is true for marriage. They, there may be an outside marriage but there might not be an inside one. Mm. So in order that man or wife do not start sinning, it is better to break up if you see no possibility of reconciliation. Interesting. It is, yeah. You don't quite expect that from a reformed person because our, I think our um, stereotype is very austere, kind of the John Calvin who's gaunt and uh, he's a statue in Geneva now with the other performers beside him on his shoulders or whatever. That's been incredibly helpful. I don't want to take up any uh, more of your time for, for conversation, but I do want to point people to your works. Um, I, so one book I've really benefited is John Calvin, A Pilgrim's Life. It's by you. I haven't finished it yet, but it's excellent. 
Um, another book is yeah the, the Kelvin Handbook that you edited as well. I know you have other books. Could you just, like, I want you to tell us about your book. So can you just say, what other books do you have that might be useful to read? <laughs> um, and you've written them. So I, I want you to, to feel allowed to talk about your books. What other books do you have that we should buy? Well, so is this the commercial part of this your is the commercial uh... part? Yeah. Well, I think authors, especially Christian authors, are sometimes hesitant, but I, uh, so I got to force it out of you. <laughs> what books have you yes. read? Else? Well, um, I, I wrote a uh, biography on Martin Luther, mm -hmm. so in a similar style as my Kelvin book, and I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, so that's that's more uh, a spiritual life. So how what is the inside of Luther? Um, what were his motivations? What was his faith? And then in a biographical uh, setting. Uh, and I, I wrote this book on um, Martin Luther's theology of marriage and divorce. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I enjoyed that. And some some smaller works. But uh, uh, Kelvin says, I don't like, like to talk about myself. So uh, I, I try to be a Calvinist. In, you'll, in you'll, uh, you'll take the Calvinist yeah. pass. And uh, Reformation 500, Refo 500, there's a website for that, right? Is that... Yes, the, the, there's a website, refo500.com, and also refork, refork, Reformation Research Consortium.com. Okay. Uh, for the, um, yeah. So our message is the Reformation is still relevant for today. Okay. I like it. I agree. <laughs> yes. <you're laughs> Although I. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the stereotypical person to agree, I suppose. Uh, Armin, that was a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for spending time. I know it's it's late yes. for you. It's uh, 10.01, right? 10.01 your time? Oh, yeah. That's not that's not too late. It's, oh, it's okay. okay. So you're yeah, yeah. a little bit late. Okay. So, I appreciate the conversation. Yeah. Well, blessings uh, on your program.